Good morning, everybody, and welcome to September's Pitch Masters Workshop. My name is Lisa Friedlander, and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer over here at Next, powered by Shulman Rogers. Next is an award-winning and innovative model for the delivery of legal services to startup and emerging growth companies. And Pitchmasters is just one of many value-added resources that we provide to the startup ecosystem to help entrepreneurs practice their pitch in a comfortable environment and receive feedback. Um, it is my honor to have SeedSpot in partnership with us and my good friend, Jorge Mendez, who participates every month um, with Pitchmasters. And I'd love, Jorge, for you to introduce yourself. Yes, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Jorge Mendez here, Senior Program Manager uh, with SeedSpot. Uh, here at SeedSpot, our mission is to educate, accelerate, and invest in diverse entrepreneurs who are creating solutions to the world's greatest challenges. And we do th we, we, we do so through uh, two core programs, one being an impact accelerator that uh, is, is fully virtual, is two months long, uh, is a dive into not only the fundamentals uh, and needed to, to have a, a strong foundation for your business, but also um, building off from there um, and, and getting ready for that next sleep. We also offer boot camps and several other partnership programs um, where you may have heard of us as well. And so I'm, I'm very happy and excited to, to be here and meet you all. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we have two entrepreneurs uh, this session, not three, so we'll have a little bit more time um, and would love to open it up to the room um, to give feedback as well, because hearing from other entrepreneurs is, is super valuable um, in and of itself. So we're going to have Sue go first. Sue, go ahead if you want to get set up and share your screen um, and followed by Davina. Um, and then we're gonna, Jorge and I will give our typical feedback and then we're gonna open it up to the room as well. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Sue whenever you're ready. You're muted, Sue. Sue, I think you're muted. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Here we go. On November 22nd, 2018, at eight o'clock in the morning, my son's birthday, I was responding to a code in the emergency room. I had to filter life-saving medication for a critical patient because it was packaged in a glass ampule. What felt like an eternity ticked by as I frantically searched for a filter needle as everyone watched, waited, and stared. As a clinical hospital pharmacist for over 30 years, I noticed a complicated process of filtering ampule-based medication. So I invented FROG, okay. a simpler, safer, quicker solution called FROG. Cartec intends to revolutionize the filter needle industry. If you've ever been to the hospital or ever had surgery, there's a high probability that you've received one of these medications. <clears throat> and this is an ampule. The, it, the ampule is a, a little sealed container of medicine, but the problem is you have to snap the net to access the medicine. And once you do that, 100% of the time, glass shards get into the ampule and contaminate the medication. Therefore, it needs to be filtered before it can be administered to the patient, which slows the whole delivery process down. Imagine the opportunity for mistakes and the added stress in an emergency situation when every second counts. Here are some of the most common meds that are in ampule form that you might know of, epinephrine, morphine, vitamin K, Narcan, and every single baby when they're born receives vitamin K. Uh, and here are some of the complicated steps. First, you have to attach the needle, filter needle, then you break the ampule, then you have to filter the medication, remove that, filter needle, throw it away, open up another needle and place it onto the syringe. So precious moments slip by and the chance for a healthcare professional to accidentally stick themselves during the needle exchange has just doubled. So I've highlighted the most high risk steps where almost 50% of all needle stick injuries occur. And here's some of the facts. 82 million ampules are opened each and every day. 2 million needle sticks cost hospitals $2 billion to treat and an extra, an extra $3 billion in wasted preparation time. That's $5 billion in avoidable cost. 
but that all ends today. Meet Frog, filter removal of glass. Frog is a simple all-in-one package, needle and filter combined. All I did was relocate the, the filter from the end where it screws onto the syringe to the tip and place it over a needle. We have three US patents in the, and we have a Canadian patent and just received a PCT. Frog is cost-effective, streamlined filter, assuring no glass particles are gonna enter the patient's bloodstream, takes half the time and practically eliminates needle stick injuries. The US global market is about a $400 million market. This is just in hospitals and $6 billion globally. We intend to disrupt and penetrate the United States first. And by the way, ampules aren't going anywhere. They're expected to grow at a CAGR of 6.6%, and it's expected to grow to a $6 billion market. Here are some of our financial projections. These are very conservative and just in US hospitals. So we should be cash positive within the next three years. However, uh, we have many more customers than this is actual showing. Um, and the cost will be the cost of both a hypodermic needle and a, and a uh, filter needle combined. So you're getting a premium product at a competitive price. And the cost to make it scale will be about five to 10 cents each. Cartec conducted clinical trials and human factor studies in both the US and in Europe. And 100% of the healthcare professionals felt there were less steps and they definitely thought that would reduce needle stick injuries. And when car frog hits the marketplace, CarTech will have the only all-in-one package, one needle filter device of its kind. The manufacturing, storage, and distribution will all be outsourced. And what I haven't mentioned up until now is we, our key strategic partner is Becton Dickinson. They're the largest needle company in the world. We have a letter of intent, right of first refusal, actual projections, and they provided all the inner needles and they funded the human factor studies. They would very much like to orchestrate the sales and marketing. All we have to do is build them and ship directly to BD if we choose to go that route. These are some of our customers. We're gonna start with hospitals, but to have a strategic partner already in place allows us to enter multiple channels of distribution at the same time. So we'll go to DOD and the veterinary industry, which is huge. We are in final preparations for FDA submission, anticipated end of November, early December. And uh, we anticipate approval anywhere from April to June. We're gonna launch with two products that'll be an 18 gauge and a 25 inner gauge inner needle. And we just received an NSF grant for a blunt needle. And we have many more products in the pipeline. My amazing team, team uh, includes my fellow pharmacists, John Nazaro and Terry Lapatka, and myself, over 95 years combined experience. John Noel, my CEO, a serial entrepreneur who excels in high risk, high payoff environments. John Brzezinski, my CFO, has extensive experience with startups and financial projections. Maria Schultz, Rick Hewen, and my amazing Kevin Flynn, patent attorney, uh, round out our team. We're on a mission all to improve healthcare and disrupt technology. I want to thank some of my supporters. I got to put Shulman and Rogers or, or Nexus up here. Uh, Tedco, Fitzy, NSF, our lead investors, old line capital partners, and the biohealth capital region. We're looking for more people dedicated to improving healthcare and supporting our mission. We're asking for $5 million. This is basically for manufacturing and distribution. And um, are you ready to take the leap? So we're looking for people that believe in our mission to help improve health care for all. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Fantastic, Sue. Really excellent pitch right under uh, seven minutes as you just as you said, um, which is terrific uh, for today for sure. Um, Jorge, any feedback for Sue? Um, yeah, Sue, that was that was lovely. It was uh, um, really interesting is actually something that um, not too familiar with. I was learning a ton um, in there as well. So I do have a couple of notes in here. Um, see if I can 
read through my chicken scratch. We'll see. Um, all right. And so the first thing is, all right, so you kicked off with a story that was personal to you and that really helps the audience, helps us to put ourselves in your position and in position of many folks that have gone through the same challenges. One th advice that I have here is that um, if you're going to start off with a personal story, maybe tie it back at the very end with it. Um, and so like it's, it's a storytelling method where you bring us back at the end and say, look, it, just like my son, just like what we experienced, this could also be you. This could be six, this, this is 1 million people a year globally, et cetera, right? So you bring it back and you expand it. Um, I like that. Yeah, it's a little bit more about storytelling, but it, 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 leaves, it leaves us with uh, a sense Happy of scope. good feeling. And yeah, but but even even a sense of scope of saying, well, and just just like my son and I, there's a million people I'm making a number up that go through this particular challenge per year, right? And so suddenly it's like you leave us with that, and that's very impactful. Um, so that's one piece in there. I did I did think even though I was learning because it's again it's something that I wasn't too familiar with, and, and thank you for for educating me. I do think like looking at it uh, objectively, um, you did spend a lot of time describing what the problem is. Um, and I didn't time it, but it felt like at least two minutes or so. Um, and then when you got to the, to the, to the slide of the facts, like that really wrapped up everything that, that we needed to know. And just kind of, um, my experience, uh, working with entrepreneurs, uh, being an entrepreneur myself and, and, and listening to at this point, probably a thousand pitches. Um, I was looking for that sheet early on the facts one, cause it just like paints a picture immediately. It gives us the numbers. It gives us the scope. Um, and although the educating piece, personally, I liked, um, I think in, in the context of a pitch for your business, it was too long, right? How do we, how do we narrow it down and how do we get to that facts slide faster? Um, so that it gives you more time to kind of dive into my other notes, <laughs> which is um, business model, right? So you, you, you showed us what um, it costs per item, um, but... I would love to see what is the business model that you all uh, are working with or are planning to execute um, in terms of, it, you mentioned your customers are hospitals, right? But what's, uh, how much are you charging hospitals? Are, are hospitals buying individual? I doubt it, right? They're buying in packages. How much are those packages, um, the, how those packages cost? Also, like what kind of give us a picture of who exactly are those customers, right? And so, is it hospitals in general, but is it is it particular types of hospitals at first? Is it hospitals in the US and Canada? You mentioned Canada as well in your patent. And so kind of just get some more clarity about who your customer is, what's your business, what's your business model, and also in what way are you are, are, are the hospitals purchasing, right? What, what's the packages that they're purchasing? Or, or the, And again, you may not have that information, but at least giving us an idea of, of what that could be once you all like scale and, and grow. Um, market size as well. Would I like to get some clarity of the the number of hospitals that exist in the United States or North America um, that could be potentially your clients? Um, and I have that number. Yeah, so we'd love to have, see, to have seen that. And these are all things that if you make the beginning shorter, um, then you can have more space to dive into that. All right, so I'm almost done here. Um, how are you selling? Hospitals and customers. Ba, ba, ba. All right. Um, I think that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than Sorry. going through the steps of, you know, removing the needle and placing it off, which is complicated, can't could I just say it, you know, complicated steps of multiple needles and multiple steps and end it right there? And then that would give me more time. For yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if 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 I'm if I'm putting on my got my my lenses of like, um, funders or investors, like it's the education piece is nice, but let's get to the facts. Let's let's get to the takeaways, um, and let's get to how this business works, because mm -hmm. that, that's what we're looking for. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And then I I guess on that lens too, if you're gonna be talk about like investments, you mentioned five million dollars, and so you mentioned that that was just and I don't have any notes, so now I'm I'm going off off the yeah. noggin. Um, it's, it, you mentioned it was 5 million and that it was for manufacturing, if I'm correct. Yeah. So if, manufacturing if, and distribution. All we have to do basically is build them and ship them directly to BD and they're going to take over the, the, they're going to orchestrate the sales and marketing. So that's really my only customer, to be honest. Right. Yeah. Now. 
unless I decide to do it myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say if, if you're gonna bring up the investment or the funding piece, also what is the return? Um, and because... we anticipate a, a ten time return on investment, and I could say that. <laughs> All right, yeah. And so, but including that in 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 that slide or, or verbally including. Yeah. That an ROI. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jorge. Great feedback. Um, I won't repeat too much. Uh, I had some of the some similar things. Um, my biggest miss was the go to market piece. And you did talk about BD and the partnership, but I wasn't 100% sure that that was your go to market strategy. Um, so if that is the case, and if that is, that's fantastic, because I think that that's the biggest risk. It sounds like you have a successful product, a medical device. It sounds like your your patent and you're getting FDA approved, but that's only half the battle, right? Without going to market and getting it actually, you know, in the hands of hospitals and uh, you know yeah, nurses and, and whatever go, everywhere. So I think it, it's I think I it's can. worth explaining a little bit more that you are not taking this to market yourself. You are partnering with BD. Who is BD? Why is that a good thing? Why, as an investor, do I care that BD is taking it to market? What does that do to your margins? Like, if that's your go to market strategy, then I think it's worth spending a little bit of time really explaining that um, because that's a huge risk. You know, that that's a huge risk of being able to execute um, on, on sales and marketing. So, if you're partnering with a, you know, stand, um, long-standing, highly reputable organization that does this all day, every day. That's great. What does that mean for your margins for your company on the downside? And then what does it mean on the upside in terms of speed to market? So I would spend a little bit more time on that. Um, your financial slide, I think, is worthless. Honestly, I can't stand it personally when, when you have that sort of Excel. It's, it's worthless. I would do something more visual that will show sort of your from launch again, exactly wall of numbers, exactly. You can't see it, can't read it, it's meaningless. Um, so something with your go-to-market with from launch, you know, obviously your pre-revenue, but from launch to, you know, year three to year five, to year 10, doesn't have to be spread out like that, but what do you expect? What are the bigger numbers um, that you expect to make during the, that time period? Um, by working with BD. And I think you got to paint a more picture than 10X. That's not enough. 10X is not enough to get VCs out of bed, I don't think. Um, so I think you got to paint a bigger vision uh, than, than 10X and redo something else instead of that financial slide. Um, the proof of concept slide was great in terms of the information, but it was very, it was all text. And I spent, I was trying to read it while you were talking. So if there are some big numbers from testimonials, just the big percentage, like put some numbers up there, 89%, you know, just try to make it less text heavy and more visual so I can get the picture really quickly. Um, trying to add some logos to your team slide. It looks like you have a super impressive team, but I don't really know much about them. So you know how sometimes you might see underneath the person, whether it's the company they work for, the university, or you know whatever it is, to give sort of a sense of a little bit more of the credibility. If you can do that, I think that would be great. And then, lastly, for me, overall, you spoke very quickly, and you do have time. So if you have a seven, you know, you said you have seven minutes for this upcoming pitch, and you finished, you know, maybe six forty-five. Um, so I think even with the feedback that we're giving you, if you tweak it a little bit and slow it down a little bit, I, I still think you'll you'll have more than enough time. Um, you just spoke, you know, and maybe you were reading, I don't know, but you just kind of brew, you know, breeze through it a little too quickly um, for me. Gotten that feedback before and I have to okay. remind myself not to yeah. keep reading it, but yeah. Exactly. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, but that's really it for me. So I'll want to take a few minutes. Um, folks, feel free in the audience. You can either put feedback in the chat for Sue. You can come on camera, stay off camera, unmute yourself, raise your hand, um, any which way if you'd like to give Sue um, some feedback.
that no one is reading that is that like the financial slide walls for your financial head. slide yeah and I so could what do you suggest how do i present that i think you just you what your financial slide is at this point is showing how you're going to make money how quickly what the scale looks like and what's the ultimate sort of where you think you're going to not max out but at full scale what does that look like so you not a chart like that. You could do a graph of some kind. You could do a time, you know, just something to give us a sense that we're going to launch with BD, right? What is BD? What is there? I would like to know from BD, like how do they take it to market? What's the expected, you know, companies that they've worked with before in year one end up, you know, X million in revenue and year five, X million and you know, year 10 and beyond kind of thing. So to me, you want to use that slide to say, I'm raising 5 million. This is where that 5 million is going to get me. This is our expected revenue. And this is, you know, the big vision of of where we can take this company. Can I say like BD is already talking, speaking about, you know, um, 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 you know, taking over and, and, um, yeah, I mean, if BD is an exit strategy, is that what you mean in terms of selling to BD? Yes, yes. Then yes, then yes. I think that that's worth mentioning. Not only are they your distribution partner, but a potential acquisition, you know, a potential exit strategy as well. Absolutely. Investors would love to know that, that you have all this lined up. Because again, the risk for what you're doing, assuming your product works, is the best product on the market for what it does you still have to take it to market. Yep. So if you're going to partner with somebody that's going to do that for you, has done it successfully, can do it in a short period of time and potentially give you an early exit within you know two to five years, any investor is going to want to know that. Okay. Yeah. That's really awesome. Good. Yeah. I, can I have one more thing here? Yeah. Uh, and taking that. And this is kind of, I want to revisit uh, storytelling um, when you're pitching um, and s slides are meant to be visual aids to what you're saying, right? And so Lisa had mentioned that she was trying to read something on the screen and, and we were, you were talking, right? And so we as human beings, like it, we, we very difficult uh, to do both, to be able to read and take in what we're reading and also listen to you and take in what you're saying, right? So what's important is what what's coming out of your mouth is the most important part. And so I would say on 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 the, on the slides on the visual side of things for each one of the slides ask yourself what do I want my listeners to remember and to take away and then highlight that right and it's kind of like a rule of thumb right and so sometimes that translates into just having like three things one two three right uh, our brain likes numbers the num even numbers and numbers of three right and or uh, like three or five anyway. I don't know. I, I'm I, I'm stumbling upon myself. But anywho, no, no, so, I get it. What, what's on screen? You it's, it's a takeaway, right? And so, for example, and I'm making up these numbers. But for example, if on a, on a particular financial slide, you have mentioned 2.5 million, 20 million, 50 million, right? And I'm making those numbers up, right? But if you have them on screen, you highlight them. I'm gonna I'm gonna latch onto that and remember that, right? Um, and so anything that's on the screen that's easy to digest, we're gonna latch on and remember. But it needs to be a visual aid. So then I could almost put like a yellow highlight on certain things, right? I highlight or have less text mm -hmm. uh, so that we have particular anchors for us to remember. And the details come from what you're saying verbally. That's like one, one way that you can make adjustments there. But you definitely want to go with less is more when it comes to visuals um, so that we can remember more and understand more. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Terrific. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Really excellent job and good luck with your pitch um, tomorrow. You. Uh, Davina, we'll turn it over to you. And you're on mute as well. Yeah. There so we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I to do that. <laughs> good morning. I'm Davina Desai. I'm the CEO of Kinematrics. And the quote you read here is the first thing that nurses often believe is the hospital should do the sick no harm. Unfortunately, hospital acquired conditions or preventable harm costs US hospitals $98 billion annually. And this is from preventable harm events such as pressure injuries, ventilator associated pneumonia, 
our first target are for our patient safety platform is hospital falls. One million patients fall each year in hospitals, and a third of those are falls with injury. Four to 10% of those result in death, around 11,000 preventable deaths each year. It extends length of stay in hospitals between eight to 12 days and costs the hospital $7,000 that is not reimbursed by health insurance companies. That is $7 billion each year that is not reimbursed to hospitals. Hospitals have been working to prevent falls. It's not a new problem. It's been there for the past 25, 30 years. And the Agency for Healthcare and Research research and quality has provided a toolkit for hospitals to use where it says you should use universal precautions such as non-slip socks. You have to complete standardized fall risk assessments, which is a joint commission mandate for all hospitals, and then identify patients at risk and use interventions to prevent those. Unfortunately, the risk assessments that are currently in place require additional documentation from nurses. They're subjective in nature, seven to 10 questions nurses have to complete at least every shift and result in overestimation and inaccurate risk prediction. That results in the high number of falls that hospitals still experience to date. What we wanted to develop was a more accurate and automated way of assessing risk in patients. So we used over 3 million patient records that have been used to both develop and validate our platform. Our cloud-based platform monitors the patient in the background. It integrates with the electronic health record. Every time there's an update to the patient record, it gets pushed to our platform, we evaluate the patient, and then we notify the clinician right back in the patient record and provide them with individualized patient risk drivers and recommended interventions based on that risk so that they can actually prevent the fall. How that works out actually is we have been able to deliver superior accuracy compared to the current standard of care. We validated this using 585,000 patient records and we are 24% more accurate than the current standard of care. And we identify 41 fewer patients as high fall risk. So those limited resources that the hospital has to prevent falls can now be deployed more accurately. And there's a added benefit is to the workflow of nurses, to of clinicians. We're automated and we provide instantaneous risk assessments. So clinicians do not have to complete this manually, which ends up reducing their workload. We of course have a competitor um, other than this current standard of care, and that is Epic. Epic currently has 80% of market share in the US for electronic health records, but their cognitive computing model for falls has less than 1% uptake because they overestimate risk even beyond the current standard of care and hospitals do not have the resources to use a tool that tells them more than 50% of their hospital is high fall risk. How that works out for a hospital is for a 200 bed hospital, a good hospital would have an average fall rate of 1.07. They would have around 214 falls each year. Using the $7,000 per fall cost number, it's 1.45 million in direct costs that is not reimbursed by health insurance companies. Once they use kinometrics, even if they prevent 25% of the falls they currently experience, which is what we have shown to be able to do, they would still save $375,000 in gross savings. And we charge hospitals $480 per bed per year as an annual subscription fee. So they still have a three to one return on investment. And we show demonstrated value to all stakeholders in the hospital cycle, starting with the staff nurses that have to do these assessments, that have to implement the interventions to prevent patient harm. The chief financial officer, there is a cost related with falls and the cost comes from non-reimbursed care. And then of course, falls often end up with settlements as well. And there is a cost associated with that, that legal and risk management is concerned with. Then the chief nursing officer that is able to better allocate resources, both staffing and fall prevention, um, fall intervention resources. And then at the end of the day, you're doing it for the patient. You want to provide zero harm care when the patient is hospitalized. 
far. We have LOI signed for two paid pilots that will go live later this year. They're going to generate $475,000 in revenue for us. We have an additional $4 million in our pipeline and a much larger LOI that feeds into that $4 million being signed um, in a couple of weeks with Orlando Health System. And then we signed an, a commercial partnership reseller agreement with Abishore. Abishore is one of the leading video monitoring companies for prevention interventions in the country. And they realize their intervention is not deployed accurately because the assessment that precedes it is not accurate. So they reached out to us to sign a commercial partnership reseller agreement so they can sell the kinematic solution as part of their suite of products when they go to hospitals. And they currently have a thousand hospital customers. And then we have approval from the VA to pilot with two to three of their site with a pathway to go um, through FedRAMP and deploy this federal wide, which includes DOD hospitals as well as Indian Health Services. Of course, falls is one of the preventable harm events in hospitals. We are going to be developing additional modules to include pressure injuries, which is a $35 billion market in the U.S., and hospital-acquired infections, which is a $25 billion market. We anticipate developing these in the next two to three years and then have five modules on our platform. So we have a land and expand strategy, of course, penetrating with falls, but then expanding to our additional health prevention of preventable patient harm solutions, which makes this a true precise patient safety platform. Our team is, of course, myself. I am an epidemiologist and researcher by um, education and practice. And Patrick, who's our chief clinical officer, is a critical care nurse with a patient safety background. Our chief technology officer is actually an engineer that has developed products. One of them was sold to GE Healthcare. And then we have advisors, both clinical and strategic. We are currently raising $1.4 million. This is to ensure we are able to complete our commercial launches and um, all the IP and regulatory around that. We have raised 850,000 of that. We have a lead investor and it is a preferred equity round at a $5 million pre-money valuation. Within five years, once we hit our ARR of around 80 million with five solutions on the market, we anticipate multiple pathways to exit. An electronic health company that's competing with Epic, we believe, is one of our strongest exit strategies. But then we also realize there are medical device companies that have softwares that are also interested in products such as Kinematrix. Just to summarize, um, our first problem is a large problem. It costs us hospitals seven billion dollars each year. We offer an automated, accurate solution for clinicians. We deliver over seventy-one percent predictive accuracy, which is significantly superior to the current standard of care or any competitors out there. And then a strong ROI for hospitals with over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars saved. And we have two signed LOIs in the. Uh, with additional um, sales in the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Davina. Um, luckily for you, we were not having to keep you to six minutes today because you were at nine. <laughs> so when that matters, you're going to have to focus in um, and figure okay. out, you know, how to how to reduce it. Um, Jorge, feedback for Davina. Uh, yes. Um, so first of all. I know it was nine minutes, uh, but overall, I think it was <laughs> excellent uh, pitch and presentation. Um, I have a couple of notes here, uh, mostly at the beginning, actually. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very small, minute thing, but in the first or maybe second slide, you have a number of 98 billion, um, but, it's, it, but it doesn't have a B next to it. None of the numbers yeah. do. Um, just it's, it says $98, yeah. I think. Uh, a small thing, but just make sure you, you add that individually. Yeah. In this in the slide after that, um, you mention um, one of the numbers is eleven that the, the one million falls translate into eleven thousand deaths. Um, I think that, but you you verbalize that, but you there's nowhere on the screen where that okay. is. and I think, okay. and I think that could be eleven thousand deaths could be a more compelling number than what you had on screen, yeah. which I think it was, I think it was like a fraction, like one in three. I don't remember, but I think eleven. Yeah is much more powerful in storytelling okay. wise. Um, 
$7 billion lost. Um, that was excellent a way to highlight that. And you kind of like, I the, the previous feedback I shared about, okay, highlight on screen what you want your readers mm -hmm. or rather listeners to remember. Uh, the, the, the first half of your pitch was uh, heavy on that, which is I would love to see. Um, all right, so you mentioned Epic as as being the the competitor, and and eighty percent market share is 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 huge. So that that could be a, a bit of a red flag. Um, mm -hmm. some chances. So, um, maybe adding a little more clarity on on how you would take in this kind of in the conversation of go to market, mm -hmm. but how, how would you? What's your strategy in taking away? Or, or rather acquiring some of the market share because they have such a stronghold at 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to have heard a little bit more of that. Um, okay, I love this slide. I haven't really seen it in this way before. Um, pain points and value props, uh, you went one yeah. by one. It did take a long time, um, but I, I I really like that, uh, the way that that was put together. It was a lot of text. I didn't yeah. read it. Uh, and so I think... Uh, take away um, that slide and a couple of other slides is how do we reduce the text to just points that our listeners can anchor to uh, and yeah. remember. So for example, I remember loving that slide, but I don't remember what's in it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, the traction slide was excellent. Um, I, I also like how y'all you included what, what's ahead, what's the potential, right? Pressure points and infections that also show and, and what the market is for that in the US that, that shows potential. Extra strategies was excellent. It was a lot of information. Um, and the extra strategies was yeah. yeah, I would say maybe for storytelling purposes or for pitching purposes, not even storytelling, narrow mm -hmm. it down so that we can yeah. latch on okay. to what you consider okay. like the top two, for example. Um, okay. so summary was excellent a lot of text maybe use bolding or highlighting to for us to latch on to different things on the summary but i did like the summary slide um it turns out it was nine minutes so i was like this is this is going on for a long time man it turns out <laughs> <laughs> and so you were able to include a lot in there uh but mm -hmm. i think given that a time constraint of six minutes or five or yeah. seven minutes there's a lot of um that we need to take away yeah. So okay. ask yourself in each one of the slides, what do I want my audience to remember and what's mm -hmm. important and what's not? Like okay. now, right now, if you have five things, can we get it up to two? Um, the yeah. trailer to the movie, not the whole movie. <laughs> yes, the trailer <laughs> to the movie, exactly, yes. <laughs> uh, anything else, Jorge? Um, uh, no, I think that- Okay. Those are my notes, yeah. Great, great. Um, well, yeah, Divina, overall, I thought your slides looked really good. Um, there were several that were very text heavy. So again, I don't repeat it, but along those same lines, maybe just go back and look at each one. But generally, they were very clean and composed. Um, I thought your pace was really good. We gave Sue a hard time for talking fast. Um, your pace was you know, much more moderated and I, I felt like it was a good pace. My problem, I had a big problem and maybe it was just me. I didn't know what you actually did. So I got you on the first, you know, hospitals, people get sick in hospitals. We all know that. We hear that all the time, right? You got to get out before you get sick. Fall risks, totally get that. See, my parents have been, you know, the big signs, patient fall risk. Totally got that. And then when you started talking about your solution and then the next, I don't know, five, six slides, I spent the whole time trying to figure out what you did. And I got at the very end, okay, it sounds like this is a new kind of patient assessment solution that can be used not just for fall risks, but for the soft, you know, the other two areas as well, which I agree with Jorge. I liked how you brought that back in and sort of phase one and phase two. But I was like, wait, she said the problem was that too many people fall. But then you kind of alluded that people, it was the assessment for fall risks were overly inclusive so that people are not actually a fall risk, that hospitals are actually overly including people, which means their resources are thinner and people are falling because too many other people were labeled fall risk, but aren't fall risk. So it, it, it was very confusing to me. And it took me too long 
in my opinion, to figure out what your solution was um, in terms of how are you preventing people from falling? Yeah, I didn't get that. You said you're preventing 25% of the falls. I don't understand how you're doing that. I got little pieces along the way, but it wasn't enough for me and I had to work too hard. Um, And it wasn't until the very end that I kind of got the sense that this is a new kind of patient assessment system. I don't know, Jorge, am I way, was that just me? Did you have any of that as well? You know, no, that's a really good insight. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I was going in the same direction. I ended up understanding more or less, but um, I think you have a really good point there of how do we make that more clear um, so that, so that we, because something that, that uh, Davina, you don't want is for your audience, whoever that may be to not understand. Right? Yeah. And, and I think I actually, Lisa, that was a good point. That when when you started talking and mentioning the feedback, I was like, "Oh, you're right." I, I didn't note that because I think yeah. I was just in the weeds. But you, you're right. I actually couldn't really define. If I, I would have failed the test of of what you all do in terms yeah. of in terms of the umbrella of like your solution to the problem, for example. Um, okay. so how do we get more clarity there? Yeah, yeah. maybe just that. sort of bring it up right up front that we are a new innovative and you only brought AI at the very end in your yeah. summary, which I agree with Jorge. I really liked the summary. It was all text, but I like you sort of, again, on the storytelling piece, like bringing it home and hammering it in at the end. But that was the first time I ever saw anything about AI, I think. okay. So yeah. I would sort of that solution side, which had a lot of stuff on it, mm-hmm. I would just be as upfront as possible that we have a new AI driven patient assessment system. And this is how it works compared to what's being done now. And this is how like, okay, so just because we're being assessed differently, how does that then lead to less falls? We we need that sort of those connections really connected. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. Okay. Terrific. But, uh, you know, again, the pitch and the delivery and the slot, you know, you're like, you know, 85% of the way there. And maybe it's just me today. Um, and that's fine. Cause you're going to get everybody, every time you pitch, you're going to get a lot of different feedback. So only take what resonates with you. Um, but I'd hate for somebody to spend half of your pitch trying to figure out what you're pitching. That's always, that's like the worst um, in terms of, you know, um, delivering a successful pitch, I think. So, no, I agree. I will actually address that. Thank you. Terrific. Awesome. And so, for our last, um, again, 15 minutes, um, anybody in the audience that are listening in and observing have any comments or feedback for Davina um, or for Sue? If anybody would like to speak up. Hi, Paul. Please Hello. do. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Good to see you again. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> um, Davina, I actually saw uh, your pitch uh, like six months ago at Riverbend. Um, yes. Which is good. So anyway, I remember it. But um, my my big thing is what Lisa already mentioned, which is y- you've got this awesome solution that to me up front, it should be like it's AI driven. You know, why does that matter? Because these nurses hate filling out these seven to 10 questions. And because they hate it, they're inaccurate and you're just going check, 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 check. That's why there's error. So you have this, you know, just automation driven. It's automatic based on information that's already entered in their chart and that you pull out and make these assessments about or, you know, and and so that's why you're better than Cerner or Epic or whoever it is who's also got the module and and people like it. So when the user community likes it and then you've you've got better statistics, it's very powerful. So to me, that's like part of the summary, but should be in the beginning. So people just understand, I got this AI yes, right away. instead of this manually intensive, inaccurate, typical, you know, kind of process, you just solve a huge problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's um, very helpful. Thanks, Paul. That is really helpful. Anybody else have comments for Davina or Sue? Hi, I, Thanks, I Laura. have a Hi. comment. Please. Hi. Um, 
I, I have a bit of a background in AI from years ago. And so one thought for you is if you do pull the AI part forward, mm -hmm. and which is, I just saw a headline like that AI, AI is getting a lot of funding right now. So it is a good opportunity, but I would expect you'd want to be prepared to talk about the ethics side of it and how you're, pre if you're doing any work mm -hmm. on preventing bias or uh, missed cases and, and those kinds of statistics. Um, and also, like others have said, how it helps the uh, staff to really assess the patient. Um, it, like, how is it really integrated into the system? Um, because uh, I think the applied side of AI is where we're going to end up talking in the next few months of this whole conversation with other kinds of AI, generative AI, and so on. Um, how are you applying it? And then... Um, does it actually function differently than not just some predict like a uh, calculated type yeah. um, system? So yeah, more understandable AI, which is defensible yeah. if there's regulations would, around it. I would think it would come in questions rather than net yeah. needing to be in the pitch, but I would be prepared mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Thanks, Laura. Thank That's you. a really great point. Thank you for that. Any other feedback for Davina or Sue? I just wanted to tell Davina, I knew Kinemetrics was was um, familiar. I was in the Inova Personalized Health Accelerator with Sam Jazzo, who was probably your pre predecessor, yeah, predecessor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was for a different product, but yeah, that's where yeah, it came yeah. from. Same company, but um, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, any final words? We might end a few minutes early this session. Okay, great. Well, a huge thank you to our fabulous female entrepreneurs, um, Davina and Sue. Good luck, ladies. You are killing it and on to something, both really incredible solutions that are innovative and transformative and will really make a huge difference in, in people's lives, which doesn't, doesn't get any more important than that. Um, a huge thank you always to my good friend Jorge from SeedSpot. Really appreciate the partnership. Thank you all for joining us today. Feel free to apply to attend or pitch at future Pitchmasters workshops. Follow next on LinkedIn and or sign up for our alert to always know what's going on. We have events regularly and lots of free resources on the website. So thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.